Welcome to Tracing Your Family Roots. My name is Arlene Sachs. I haven't been here in a while, but uh, I'm back for a change. And this is Chuck Mason. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to be interviewing Chuck, who's usually asking the questions, I think. <laughs> uh, Chuck is a professional genealogy genealogist, uh, which means that he can get paid for um, doing work. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the, some of the advice that he gives when he gives classes on genealogy. Um, I guess first explain what a professional genealogist is, or what what you went through to become well, one, or uh, certified. Originally, for twenty years, I was a certified genealogist by certified by the board for certification of genealogists, and it's a process that you go through. There's no prescribed education that you have to go and do this, this, and this, but you go through finding uh, an education or developing an education for yourself. Usually it's tied to a specific area. It might be a state, group of states, a country, a, a region, something like that, or a topic, and then you're approved for Five years, and every year, you, or every five years, you go back and you renew that certification. Two years ago, I decided not to go through that process again, so I still take clients. That's why I'm considered a professional genealogist, but I'm just not certified by the board. So, so. do they actually? That's just for U.S. research, though, isn't it? No, it is. It is, it is worldwide. It has been for as long as I've been around. Yes. Okay. So. I guess most of the ones I met were certified for the U.S. Yes. So not, not, yeah. Not the yeah, ones you, that did research in Eastern Europe uh, weren't what we call certified, but right. they certainly knew, knew, knew what right. they were doing. Right. Um, okay, so uh, you offered a different place, place how did you develop this course? Well, when I was in 2004, when I was getting ready to renew my certification, you know, I had become a lot more organized. I had attended a lot of conferences and things. And I saw teaching Fairfax County Adult Ed, I saw where a lot of people were stumbling because they really didn't know how to organize things and things like that. So I came up originally with 10 things that I called shortcuts, which as I explained in the beginning of the class, some of these things are not going to look like shortcuts <laughs> when you look at them, but they are going to be time savers if, if you follow them. And so there were 10 of them, and along the way I've increased it to 15. Uh, things so so these are skills that people and I tell them don't look at starting with all of them start baby steps do this don't. see how that helps do that see how that helps I, I guess one of the most uh, important things is to plan what you're going to do and yes uh, yes no matter where whether you're running down to the national archives the library of congress you know you, the local public library a family history center before you go you want to make sure that you've planned things out that you have organized the research you have before or have done before and have everything ready so when you go down there you can hit the road and start looking at what you want to look at, that you've taken with you whatever you may need as far as documents or papers or anything else. Uh, if you have your genealogy in a genealogy program, is it updated? Take your computer. You don't want to get down there and find you left something important <laughs> at home and have to go. you can't do any research. <laughs> I, I think that's, that, that, that that is so important, not only for a, going to a local archive, but particularly if you're doing overseas. Uh, you yes. don't want to get over or Or, or if or you're conference. going halfway across the country, you that, know, that, here. Oh, I, I didn't br bring that computer or bring all of the printouts that you might possibly need, need. Um, yeah. depending the, on... The first time I went to Salt Lake to do research, 
I had what was known as a salesman's sample case. It was about <laughs> this wide, about that deep, and about that tall, and it was loaded with stuff because at the time I didn't have a laptop. They really weren't that common, and so I needed to take stuff. <laughs> now well, I take been... the laptop case with me. Yeah, that mo most most places let you in with a computer now. In fact, encourage it so you don't have to paper and pencil. And so like then, you can, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, 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 sort of off this topic, when you get to these places, do you find that most of them just have, give you uh, or show you uh, digitized versions, or will they let you? Uh, a lot of places still so let you look at the, the records. It, it part of it depends on how fragile are the original records. If they're really fragile. They're going to send you to the microfilm or the digitized version or whatever. So, so another thing that, that I developed to help keep track of my research is something called a research calendar. So this is the second uh, shortcut. And it's just a listing of when I do things. When I go to a facility, I may do one for that facility, I may do one for you know, the specific person or family. It depends on how involved the project is going to be. And I list when I went there, where I went, what I found, what I didn't find, and basically how to go back and find it. So what's the, the uh, number of the book or the number of the microfilm or things Things like that. Well, and here, here's where we differ a little bit. You do it sort of in a in a word perfect word a, document. A, a yeah. Word document. I would use a spreadsheet, spreadsheet. for all, all yeah. of that. I like the spreadsheet because I can, you know, especially when I've done a lot of research. It, a beginner may, might think, "Oh, I'll remember this," and I guarantee you, they you're won't. not going to. Uh, yeah. But you can have, you know, the person you're searching, the or the, yeah. the the city, the time. The date you're searching, did you find something, didn't you find something? And then if you want to go back, even if it's for a different person, it'll tell you, you know, yeah. what you found or whether yeah. they have nothing for that and, town or and whatever. And it just depends on what you're comfortable. I never got comfortable with, with Excel. <laughs> so. I think most people today, uh, except if they're my age, are fairly comfortable <laughs> with, with uh, you're the exception, yeah, with, with a, a spreadsheet, spreadsheet. Um, because... To a certain extent, I think you can do that in the word processing programs yeah. now too. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. if you can set that up, uh, but I, I think for for people that are starting and, and don't have any computer experience, it really helps to have a younger person show, show you a little bit on, on this. On. Yeah. It, it really helps in the long yeah. run. Yeah. And, and your next thing goes right along next with that. Next thing is a correspondence log. Uh, when I got involved uh, in the mid to late 1980s, we didn't have computers. And so a lot of what we did was through the US mail. So I used a correspondence log, which kept track of any mail that I, that I sent off, any letters or anything. And you can also use this for emails, where you're emailing, because I find that I will send something off, and you know, a month later, I think, well, last week or the week before, I sent this, and I haven't heard anything. Yep. So this is something to keep it in front of you, so you follow so, up with, with again, checking it's, it's on that. Again, it's the same thing, type of thing. It to me, it helps to put that on a spreadsheet, spreadsheet. and sometimes yeah. you might need different spreadsheets Sheets. for totally different topics. Yeah. But yeah. the correspondence log, whether you're emailing or, or the olden days, whether you're writing, writing a letter, letter, so you don't write to the same place twice. And we do still have to use the U.S. mail for some things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and then the, the next thing I, I think has been one of the things that has really been helpful to me, and that is when I find a document, I make a transcription of it. It's a word-by-word -word copy of what it says. I don't change anything that's incorrect as far as spelling or grammar or things like that. I will put in notations like in a square box that I'm putting this in, or if I find a legal term that's new that I looked at, I may put that definition in there. 
and I go through the document because you don't want to have to go back and reinterpret some of the documents that you find. <laughs> well, I, I, again, I have a slightly different take on it. I would also take a picture of it. I don't. Yeah. Because well, you might have totally misinterpreted it, and that's one of my big things in, in, in these days, of misinterpreting things because you didn't understand the history written. of when it was, it was written, written. Where, where something might say something like, a boat drove off. How can a boat drive, drive off? off? Well, if you go into the history and find out what they were talking about, it might have been a pontoon bridge, bridge. or something yeah. that's totally, totally logical to yeah. the person writing. And something like that, I would put that in my square brackets. But you might, yeah, you might so not have no when idea I do what the, they mean. Well, but you know, if I if yeah. I find something, because you know, documents. I have one document. It's a deed that begins at the end of the page, and of course, I'm used to going and making microfilm copies. So a lot of the documents I was dealing with were microfilm copies. But you still find this when you can find things on the internet and download them. They're not always clear. And what happened with this document, the first page of the microfilm was fine. But up in the right-hand corner where the description of the property, which is so important, came in, it was almost black for about six or seven inches in both directions. I mean, you could see through the blackness there were letters. So I literally, with that one, took that document, put it in a photo editing program, blew it up, and sat there erasing pixel after <laughs> pixel till I could, could get be. the words and see what, what they were. And I have another one that's a four-page will that it is so light, so poor. I think I have about 25 hours into trying okay. to transcribe it because it's just so poor. And I've got the gist of it. I don't have a word-for-word -word transcription of it. But even smaller things, if you're dealing with old handwriting or you're dealing with uh, documents in German, so you want that transcription to English or translation to English. It's so important that you make those the first time and then you can always go back to them. And keep, I, that's why I keep a copy, uh, that's why uh, it, within my, my genealogy program, I put all of the those. pictures in. Um, it, suppose there's a fire, my yes. stuff is on a memory stick I can grab. Yes. Um, the fire might destroy things, yeah. but I still have that. Uh, yeah, I, grab that I, memory I stick. keep keep the memory stick too, and it. You know, I learned this from going to a document, and later down the road, I needed to look at it again, and I'm back trying to reinterpret handwriting and dealing with all of those issues. So, even if it's it's a handwritten and short document. If it's hard to read, I will do that transcription mm -hmm. the first time so I have it. Well, you I don't know what you, what you have until you've done the transcription. Is well, yeah, another way of looking exactly. at it? Exactly. Just you, make sure you record it. Yeah, exactly. You, you don't always know or understand what it may say. And, and as I said, you know, I will, will put explanations in there in those square brackets so anybody looking at it knows it's not a part of the document but you know and particularly sometimes you'll encounter a legal term that you don't know and it may be the only time you encounter it so you're not going to really from using it and encountering it over and over remember no. the the definition well, so. a lot of the the well, at least the genealogy program I'm using now by each picture, there's there's a description, mm -hmm. and that's where you. Uh, that's why I would put the the trans tra transcription, transcription. In, or yeah. my comments, or, or when it was taken, or what I know about it. Yeah. Um, so that would help, you know, future people looking at it. At it. Yeah. So then, you know. But then, what, uh, then you have something about abstracts. I don't yes. think I've ever done that. Well, abstracts are done uh, for a variety of reasons. In some cases, particularly years ago, 
places didn't have photocopiers. They may have had microfilm printers, but they didn't have photocopiers where you could go in. I encountered, it's probably getting close to 25 years ago, I went to a cemetery and they pulled out records of about 15 families that I had buried in that cemetery. And I wanted copies of the cards that they yeah. had information on. They didn't have a photocopier, they didn't have a computer then. So I had to literally sit there with paper and pen and copy those documents. I remember seeing like the census papers that they used to have where you could write, copy, thank God for the cell phone these days yes. that takes, takes yes. pictures of it all. But people, people would abstract things and particularly for publishing them in books and articles where instead of having all of the, the words out of a will or, or a yeah. deed, they pulled the important facts, the parties involved, the date it happened, the location, yeah. things like that and they would abstract them. Well, one of the problems with abstracts that people did, there might be something that's important to you and your research, but meant yeah. nothing to yeah. them, so they didn't abstract it. So it's a way of getting information, but a shortened form. And I, instead of doing an abstract, I take my transcription. And now today in Word you can actually do the, the yellow highlight. highlighter, but I used to do the yellow, the smelly yellow mm -hmm. highlighter and would highlight mm -hmm. the important things that I'm most likely going to be interested in. So who, who was selling the land, who was buying it, what they paid for it, where it was located, when it happened and all, I would highlight those things. The thing that I liked about my transcription slash abstract was, I didn't have to go pull another document out to look at the whole thing if I had a question. I got it right there in front of my face. I just have to read mm -hmm. past the yellow <laughs> highlighted portions. So it makes it a lot easier to, to actually deal with a document. Uh, okay, so you got a bunch of records. Mm -hmm. How are you gonna handle them? Well, First of all, I always say I group the records together. So when I'm looking at or trying to find something out, I look at what's in the record group. So to me, a land record has at least two documents. It has when the person bought it and when they sold it. And I wanna know what the original deed tells me, and I want to know what the selling deed, the, where they're getting rid of it, tells me. Mm -hmm. Number one, you know, is the acreage the same and things like that. And other things, uh, I specialize in death records. So that's looking at the death certificate, the obituary, the death notice, the funeral home records, the cemetery records, the tombstone, mm -hmm. the will if there is a will. So anything that is related to that event, the death of that person, I put those all together. So I group them together when, when I'm putting them you know, into my files or whatever. I have them together so I can pull out or pull up. So you have a big file for person X and you might have a folder, folder. for the death record. Well, usually they're just... Uh, paper clipped together or okay. or in my genealogy program as I organize. I haven't gone back and, and scanned the paper that I have, so I still have the paper files. But most of what I've been doing in the last 10, 12 years where I can scan or pull an image like off of Family Search or a website and get the image, I have a file folder within the genealogy program for that person oh. and I will put those things together so that you have them all organized. As far as my, my papers and things, uh, you know, if it's, if it's just something I could go replace, I don't bother with like acid-free boxes and, and mylar sheets and things. But if it is something that is an original, like I have my, Great grandparents' original marriage certificate from I think it was 18, 
78 or 79 up in, in New Jersey. I have the original certificate, so I have that in a Mylar sheet in an acid-free box so that I, I, I can I've put, save all put, those pretty things. Pretty much everything that I've gotten into the acid-free, I, I really, yeah. uh, the, at least I know this is separate. This is, yeah. Then I have a, a whole file cabinet of stuff that stuff. isn't important that, 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 yeah, that things, I just keep. Things you've got, copies and things uh, like that. Yeah, where, but but where, I, even the stuff, um, the, even though I got it off the web, uh, you know, like from Family Search or something, so that has a picture of the original sure. document. I, to me, that's quote unquote the original document. It's their we, handwriting. Yes, it's a Xerox copy of it, but it's yeah. as original as I can possibly get. Yeah. Uh, so that all goes in in, in my acid-free materials. Yeah, to, to you know, if, if it's something that I've copied off the internet, those I scan and yeah. put into onto the flash drive that, well, I, I, that I, put, I use. I, I scan them. But one thing I made a mistake on uh, is once I started putting the pictures and I just put them all in one big folder and suddenly I had this a million pictures, <laughs> oh my God. But then I can't change them because the, the, the program can find them perfectly, perfect. I can't. can't. And so then I started doing it by families. Yeah. Um, but it was too late for some yeah, of them. I, to I, I took a, a class um, I, at a family history center, oh, probably 15 years ago, on how to organize, digitally organize pictures. And it, it's a great help, and it's organizing them by families and individuals and yeah, things Yeah, I, like I do that. anything now goes into one of the family folders. Yeah. But, and then I have those subdivided, too, as we get right. further back and right. stuff. So, and then one of the other things that I have found helpful, and this is... Shortcut number seven uh, is using timelines. Sharon Hodges, who has been a guest a number of times on the show in the past, put together this program on timelines. And it has been so useful. Uh, you might do it a timeline for the person and list dates and events and things like that. It helps organize. It might be something on the area that you are researching. And I just happened to take a county history for Gloucester County, New Jersey, and put together a timeline example where I was talking about timelines. Mm. And I pulled some important information out of the county history. I didn't do the whole thing because it was page after page. But, but at one point, I was trying to find a family that lived in Woodbury in Gloucester County, which is the county seat and was the original county seat. And I could not find them in the 1870 census. And this was back before we had Ancestry and some of the other resources. I couldn't find them. And at one point, I was doing the portion of the lecture about timelines. And I'm looking, and down at the bottom of the timeline, I had noted that Woodbury was not an incorporated city until like 1878. Absolutely. Well, when I went back and looked into the history, Woodbury, even though it was the county seat, was a part of Defford Township. And so that's, that's where I had to go to find this family. So you can put these, yep. these together, you know, for any topic that, that you might find that's, helpful. I think, you know, I, I, I said understanding what you're reading and understanding the history. Sorry. And, yes. you, you know, I was never interested really in history until I got into genealogy. Oh, I, I loved history when <laughs> I was in school. <laughs> I did. I, you know, I was a, memorizing a bunch of dates. I, I thought it was terribly boring. But now it's not only memorizing those dates, it's understanding Dating. what happened. Yeah. And like understanding that this was not part of, of, of the, uh, the city. It was part, considered part of that, Those are the little, little things, things that... that, that um, yeah, yeah, it, it just really You just learn does. it as you go along. And of course, then, then tip number eight is having a filing system. Uh, you know, I have a filing system on that flash drive that I use for organizing my, my things that I have gathered and you know, 
all, but you also need a paper system. You have to have a way of finding those papers that you don't have. Because I've got a four drawer file cabinet <laughs> stock full of stuff and in order to understand it. So what I did was I started out early with notebooks. My first teacher said, all you need for all your research is a three inch, three ring yeah. binder. Well, I had that filled in less than six months. <laughs> And when I got to the four major uh, family names in my genealogy and I filled those notebooks, I, I've got to find something else. <laughs> so that's when I went to a file folder for every person that I had at that time and everything went into that. Now if it related to like census records, I put it in the head of the household. If that person became the head of the household later than all the census records from them, therefore would go through. If it was like my grandmother marrying my grandfather, I knew to look in his folder till she became the head of the household after yeah, he that, died. That's what becomes, a, what I did was for the direct family, nice. and, and I wasn't so concerned about cousins and stuff like that. I, again, made a spreadsheet and listed every place that not only their name appeared uh, where they were the person, but if it, they were listed as a father Mother. on another document, document. They, they would be listed. But I think we might need to talk about this a little bit more, more. in the second part of the show. Yes. So if yes. you're listening, folks, um, yes. we'll talk another 30 seconds or so. Well, we, Tune into the second part. We <laughs> do want to thank the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society for sponsoring us. Uh, and they are still not meeting because of COVID, but, and they also don't have the library open, but they're hoping by the end of September to be able to start meeting in person again, but they are meeting on uh, Zoom. So you can go to the website and find information. And it was nice to have you back, Arlene. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad Thanks. that, that uh, we could get together and talk. Yeah, so. we could always talk. Thank <laughs> you.